Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. We are so excited that you are joining us for the show today. This podcast aims to explore a biblical life view in a conversational tone. Let's join our host and founder of Servants of Grace, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today is Patrick Schreiner. Patrick, welcome back to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. Thanks for having me again. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's always good. I, I appreciate your your work. So thank you for serving the church. Well, can you uh, please catch us up on what's going on in your life, marriage, ministry? What are you working on writing project-wise or, or there at Western Seminary? Right. So I'm stepping into my sixth year here teaching at Western Seminary. I teach New Testament and Greek. It's great. And um Married to Hannah, we have four kids, and they're getting older every year, as every kid does. And so we're enjoying them. It's just summertime here, so it's great to be outside in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in terms of my projects, I have a few writing projects that I'm working on right now. Um, I just finished up a, a short manuscript on the Ascension with Lexham Press, which is just looking at that doctrine from Prophet, Priest, King, uh, a lens. And so that'll be a short little book on the Ascension, which I hope will be helpful. No idea when it's going to come out, but uh, hopefully sometime. And then my biggest project that I'm working on now is a commentary on Acts with B&H. And um, that is due in about a year in terms of my main script. So it'll go through the processes. But um, I, I'm really loving working on that. This is my first commentary that I have to work on. And so uh, I'm really enjoying that. It's a very long book, though. <laughs> 28 chapters, which is fun, uh, but also challenging to try to summarize and make it useful for the church and do good scholarship all at the same time. I decide, what should I include? What should I not include? How much should I say about this? How little should I say about this? And so forth and so on. And then um, the final book that I'm working on is um, an overview of the New Testament where I kind of give uh, an image of the literary overview of, of the Testament book and then a written, in written form about a page uh, summary of, of the New Testament just with Moody. So those are my three kind of basic projects right now and i'm almost done with one of them uh, about halfway through commentary writing and then just starting on the moody ones so a few few things going on right now yeah yeah definitely and then your uh, how are things at the church the church is going really well we're at a five and a half year old church plan i'm an elder that i'm preaching this sunday and um yeah we're just having a great time it's slow and steady work here uh we're seeing the lord work and we have a really tight-knit community so we're really thankful to be here oh wonderful it's great to hear what's uh what the lord's up to with you patrick so thank you for sharing uh can you what was that i just said thanks (laughs) oh sometimes i go too fast (laughs) sorry about that can you can you uh tell us about your book matthew disciple and scribe the first gospel and its portrait of jesus why did you write it and um well how do you hope it'll be received Right. Yeah. Um, so I did my work in HD on Matthew, and um, it's always kind of been, in terms of my studies, my first that sense of terms of like, where do you focus on? I'm, I'm just a Matthew guy. Uh, I saw Andrew Wilson the other on Twitter, a guy in the UK, a pastor. What's your favorite gospel? And uh, everyone said John, and I, I, I cried myself to sleep that night because my, my favorite gospel is Matthew. Um, I understand how people can like John, but actually the early church really loved Matthew. Um, they really loved John, they loved Matthew, and they used Matthew almost the most. And so I just always had this um, tendency towards Matthew. And there's a lot of great books on Matthew, um, but not really a like hermeneutical, biblical theology, like one-stop shop for Matthew. And I feel like that's one of the biggest payoffs for Matthew. So what, I, what I'm doing with Matthew, what I try to do is just kind of give an overview of how he views the Old Testament, why he's writing, uh, uh, and looking at how he presents Jesus, especially in terms of, uh, I'm looking at what I call the shadow stories of the Old Testament, which are going through the entire gospel. So um, really, it's a push, uh, and a lot of people are saying these things, but you can't understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. You can't understand the gospels without understanding the stories that came before it and how Jesus fulfills those stories. So really, my, my hope is that as people read it, they would say, wow, there's so much more more going on in these maybe simple stories that you've heard your whole life about Jesus than initially you would think. So there's a surface level reading that it just makes sense. Jesus is born, he's challenged, he heals, he teaches, 
dies upon the cross, he's raised from the dead. But as you begin to look at those stories in more detail, you start to see, wow, these all have echoes to Old Testament stories. And there's a deeper meaning that comes as you begin to see that. And so there's a depth and a beauty to what I call the form of Matthew's gospel um, that I'm trying to just maybe just tune people into in terms of, look, there's more to this literature. And I would say that's probably true for the rest of the New Testament, the rest of the scriptures. But I'm just looking at math at this point saying there's more there than initially meets the eye. And so I hope, uh, ultimately, I hope that people love Jesus more because of it, obviously, and that they uh, want to serve the church more, and they want to read the gospel more, and want to read the scriptures more, and fall in, more in love with the scriptures. Yeah, you, you said something pretty interesting just there, well, a lot of interesting things, but but uh, one thing that I picked up on was uh, how the how did the early church use Matthew? I, I know that, I think I was trying to think of where I read this this source, so so maybe you know the source, uh, but, but how did the early church use the gospel of Matthew? you for for discipleship and training of early Christians. Right. So the book of Matthew and the gospel specifically was huge in terms of their litur- liturgy and their catechism in the early church. So if, if you just go to the, the different documents and that we have in terms of their liturgy, Matt and John and the gospels just make up a huge part of their training in the church. So scripture reading, confession, so forth and so on. Um, and so Matthew and the gospels were just huge in terms of the training of the next generation. Um, which I think as Protestants, sometimes we're, we tend towards all um, because it's propositional truth, there's clarity, this is the point of the text, so forth and so on. And there's there's great truths there that we, we, we need to um, press into, but the early church really pressed into the Gospels and the story of Jesus, and I think that's something we can maybe recover more in the modern day. Uh, what, what, what would such a recovery look like? Yeah, I think uh, a recovery would look like seeing uh, the Gospels as kind of this climax of the scriptures again if you're looking at the narrative of the scriptures um obviously climax in terms of the climax at the end as well but the climax in terms of this is this story and this is the story of israel and when jesus steps on the scene he completes that story he as matthew puts it he fulfills that story through his life his ministry his death his rest and his ascension paul and the rest of the new testament authors the epistles you know how do you live this new christian or this new jesus life now that he's appeared uh and if you, if the Bible is, and I believe it is, at its base form and narrative, you have poetry, you have law, but at its base form, what's carrying it along is the story. Then really the Gospels are that completion of that story. Um, they are the climax of a story with the steps on the scene. So what would that look like in our churches? I think that just looks like um, being more involved in the Gospels and not just viewing them as the same story four times over, um, not just viewing them as, oh, yeah, really Paul and uh, James and John they give us the, the theology, but these are just the story. No, 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 the theologies of Paul, the theologies of the author of Hebrews, these are all coming from the theology that is inherent in the narrative itself, inherent in the stories of the Gospels, and so um, preaching them, reading them, using them uh, in terms of our songs, in terms of worship, using them in terms of our confessions, um, I, I think just centering back on the Gospel would be a good thing to do, and I think, I think we have seen some movement in that in terms of Christ-centered hermeneutics, but sometimes even we have Christ Christ's and then we don't preach on the Gospels, or we don't speak of the Gospels. I mean, this is when Jesus comes. This is why, part of the reason I think we have four Gospels, we need we need four different views of Jesus, and it's one Jesus that have this kaleidoscopic view of Jesus, because really one one story can't summarize who is. You do need those four different pictures. And so I think even if you look at how these stories are told and how they're written, um, the divine author of the Scriptures, in terms of God himself, wanted us to hear that story again and again and again again of Jesus because we believe Jesus is the true and the final revelation of God, the most clear picture of God in the incarnate and what he's done. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like I could spend days and days talking about we need the Gospels and we need to center on them, center our lives on them, center our ministries on them. It's not at the expense of the rest of the books of the Bible, but rather there is a flow and there 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 is a, um, a rash relieved in the Gospels. That's a really good answer. Really good. What are Matthew's contributions to the whole of biblical theology? Yeah, so 
That's a great question. Um, Matthew was put at the head of the canon, New Testament canon, by the early church, always at the head of the canon. And really, biblical theology is asking, how do the new and the old relate? How does the new and the old covenant relate? Uh, how do these two testaments go together? I mean, this is why denominations have been formed, because they have different views on these things. This is one of, if not the biggest question in biblical studies and in the Christian walk. I mean, think about the Jew and Gentile issue in the early church. This is how does the new and the old relate? Uh, and so I think the, the church is always returning to that question of, okay, we have the old covenant, Israel, we have the new covenant, how does this relate to the new covenant, how does Jesus relate, what happens to the Torah, what happens to the covenant with Abraham, what happens to the covenant with Moses and with David, and so forth and so on, how the new covenant, how new is the New Testament, uh, is it just a repackaging of the old, is it, uh, so, <laughs> there's so many huge questions, does circumcision relate to baptism, you know what I mean, you get into these massive debates that we've had, and I think Matthew is actually Actually opening the New Testament, teaching us uh, about new and the old relate. So if biblical theology, I know there's a bunch of different views of how you define biblical theology, but if it is tracing the narrative of the scripture, then Matthew is coming and he's sitting at the end of the New and the Old Testament, and it's actually turning that page and saying, how, how do these two tests, how do these two covenants relate to one another? And uh, he's opening, giving us kind of the broadest view that he can. Paul's dealing, and the other epistles are dealing with specific issues in the churches, but Matthew, as a Jewish writer, I believe, is looking at this and saying, okay, as a Jew, how does Jesus fulfill the Old Covenant and the Old Old Testament? Uh, and so I think the contributions are just at a very high level, uh, how the New and the Old relate. So how does Jesus fill the Davidic, the Mosaic, the Abrahamic Covenant? How is Jesus the New Abraham, the New Moses, the New David, the New Israel, the New Solomon, the New Elijah, the New Elisha, the so forth and so on? And so all of his stories are just uh, really brimming to the surface with this idea yeah, that Jesus comes and he actually completes the story of Israel. So that's a really odd answer, but I, I do think it's one of those gospels and one of those places that we need to go and actually begin, maybe start our biblical theology with even, I mean, maybe I'll give you a specific example. How does Matthew summarize the whole Testament story? He actually does so in the genealogy. He actually summarizes the whole Testament story in the first verse of his gospel, which is eight words in Greek. He says, you can understand the whole Old Testament through a few people. It's Jesus, who is the Messiah, David, and Abraham. <laughs> That's the whole Old Testament story, and actually, the first words also also echo echo Genesis, and so you've got you've got the whole Bible and the first words of Matthew, mm -hmm. and so uh, there's a huge question right now in terms of like, hey, what's the best way to summarize the scriptures? Well, he's kind of done it for us. <laughs> he starts the whole New Testament according to the early church. I know he didn't start in the new whole New Testament, but where the early church placed him. And he said, here's how to understand your whole Testament here. Here's how Jesus completes that story. So, mm. I mean, we, this whole book is about biblical theology and hermeneutics, but at a very high level, how do the new and the old relate? And that's Matthew's kind of project. Mm. It's really interesting. Um, really interesting. Good stuff. What advice do you have for Christians in, in reading and studying the Gospel of Matthew? Yeah, I've kind of already hinted at it, but I think um, one of the things my book is trying to do is to say every time you read a story, any story in any of the Gospels, but especially in math now, you should ask, uh, and I think I have three questions in the book. I can't remember what the three questions I ask because, you know, it, how it goes when you write a book, but it's something like, how does this story echo of this of Israel? How does it complete the story of Israel? And how does it move the story of Israel forward? Or something to that. So every story that you read, you should be saying, okay, what what's happening in here? Not just that, and I talked about that surface level meaning, deeper level meaning. So how does this story, um, how, what, what, what echoes does it have to the Old Testament? So maybe the uh, best way to give you an example. Um, right after the genealogy, you come into the birth of Jesus' story. And you've got this figure named Joseph who has dreams. And he has dreams about how his wife is pregnant and she's she's ha has a son that's conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you should be asking yourself, okay, do I know of another Joseph who has dreams? Yeah, I do. It's in the Old Testament, it's at the end of the Genesis account where you have Joseph who has dreams. And what happens with Joseph? Well, that Joseph has to bring his child or his, sorry, Joseph in the Old Testament has to bring his nation into Egypt to save them. And what happens with this Joseph? This Joseph has dreams and he also has to bring his child into Egypt to save him from a king. Hmm. Now, Matthew, as you get into Matthew 2, it's not Pharaoh 
who's seeking to destroy this child, but it's actually King Herod. And so you start to think, oh, maybe maybe there's some more going on here. And it's actually confirmed as you come to Matthew 2, because as Matt quote from Hosea, out of Egypt, I've called my son. So Jesus is new Israel. Joseph is this new Joseph type who's obedient to the Lord, who's going to save this new Israel figure, who is Jesus. So Jesus isn't this figure, but he's actually completing the whole story of Israel. So um, how is it moving it forward? Or he's, well, he's not just saving them from the Egyptians. Uh, He's not just saving them from home. He's actually saving them in Matthew 1 from their sins. And so this redemption is actually a great redemption than Joseph could ever provide for his people, although it was part of God's redemptive plan. And so when you begin start, when you start asking questions like that, suddenly these texts bring on, I think, a relative historical meaning that deeper than how do we interpret dreams? What do we do with this? It's no, Jesus is coming as the fulfillment of all of your hopes and dreams, not just Israel's hopes and dreams, but all of your hopes and dreams. Like what are, as a pastor, I'm telling people, Israel had hopes and dreams. Do you have dreams? What are they? And Jesus comes and he's saying, they will only be satisfied in me. So looking at just that big narrative and saying, okay, what what story comes behind and end this, and what is Matthew trying to do with his own story, uh, and how he tells this, what happens to Jesus. And I, you know, modern critical scholars will say, well, if it's an, too much of an echo, then that means it's true historically. I don't think that's true at all. I think Matthew's coming to the real story, the historical Jesus, and saying, how can I tell this in a way that speaks the lingo Jews already know, right? So how, how, does, how do I speak? And as authors and speakers, we're always trying to speak in ways that people can understand. And that's simply what Matthew's doing. He's forming and crafting his stories of Jesus. He was a follower of Jesus in ways that people can understand in that day. And for us, it's just a recovery. How well do we know our Old Testament? How well do we know those stories? How well do we know those echoes? I think they would be picking up on those echoes as they go. And we just, this book is kind of me trying to say, let's look at some of those things again. So uh, your question was, what advice? Go back to the Old Testament. Go back to the Old Testament and see how the stories of Matthew echo the Old Testament story. They complete that. Yeah, I think I think just reading the Old Testament would be a good good place for for many Christians not to spend so much time in the in the New Testament. But but uh, ever since I was a teenager, I started reading the Bible when I was probably five or six, and and just uh, I, I spent more time reading the Old Testament than I did the New Testament. You know, and that's intentional yeah. because you know not because I'm neglecting the New Testament either, but because I want to spend more time in the Old Testament. Um, that's right. Because uh, I want to get to know it better. There's just so much there and. Um, you know, there's a difference between just reading it and studying it. You know, when we're studying it, we're getting into the culture and understanding those types of things. And and um, so, yeah, that, that's a really good answer. Uh, what advice? What advice do you have for a pastor or Bible study leader who wants to be faithful in their teaching to the text? They are considering in Matthew while also pointing pe- uh, people from that text. They are teaching to the Lord Jesus. Yeah, so it's getting at how can we be faithful to the text and also point to Jesus in a in a faithful way in terms of the scriptures. And I think what Matthew does for us is he shows us, just as I kind of already spoke, spoke about with that E. Joseph narrative, um, Matthew is giving us the license to see Jesus in Old Testament stories. Um, if you're looking at his literature more, more closely, you can see what he's doing. You can even see it at a, um, a very surface level reading with all the fulfillment quotations that he uses. So Matthew used the fulfillment quotations more than any other gospel writer. Uh, he's very explicit in saying, look, when Jesus comes on the scene, he is fulfilling all of these Old Testament stories. So um, when pastors come to texts that don't explicitly have Jesus in them, I think Matthew is actually great training ground, and this is part of the purpose of my book. It's great training ground to teach you hermeneutically how to go from one text to another, how to see in a faithful yet creative way how Jesus is in every story. And so I think the expansiveness of Matthew's gospel and how one of the chapters in my book is arguing that actually Matthew's structure is following the whole Hebrew Old Testament structure, the whole Torah itself. And so one of what Matthew's trying to do is he's actually trying to teach his disciples and future disciples, future generations of disciples, how to read their whole 
scripture together. I know the whole scripture wasn't put together, but how to read this whole redemptive historical story together. And so really what Matthew is doing is he's kind of alongside pastors and saying, are you nervous about this? Or are you unsure about how to do this? Let, let, me, let me show you exactly how this works. Let me show you how Jesus completes these stories, how, how he uh, repeats these stories and how he moves these stories forward. So um, I have a few little pointers for people in terms of book, how this looks in terms of, I think you need to read forward um, in terms of from the Old Testament into the New Testament, into Jesus' story. And Matthew's teaching us you have to read backwards as well. And so what that means is you have to take the story of Jesus and say, hmm, maybe there's something here also that I never saw in the Old Testament. But now that Jesus is here, it clarifies things that were already there in the Old Testament, but I couldn't see it yet until Jesus came up. So I think there's kind of this forward and backward reading that you go through as pastors where you're like, does this make sense? Does it fit in terms of literary context? Are there um, like syntactical level word connections that are here? Is there explicit quotation, and even if there's an explicit quotation, does the story itself, so I mentioned the story of Joseph, are there enough connections with Joseph of the New Testament and Joseph of the Old Testament to say, ah, there's something going on here? I think there is, with the dreams, with it, uh, with saving the nation, so forth and so on. There's enough there to say, okay, there's something happening at a deeper, deeper level. Now, people might disagree about how much you can tie those connections and so forth, so I think that's a, that, that's a good uh, conversation to have in this book as part of that conversation. I don't think that I'd ever thought of that connection before so so uh i, I thought that was really interesting because i i don't think i'd ever made that connection before i mean i probably should have made that connection but uh I, I really appreciate that connection because I, I I do think that it's something whether they agree or not people agree or not it's still uh, I think a valid connection and and the way you presented the argument I think is is persuasive so mm-hmm. well Patrick are there particular challenging passages in Matthew that people have uh, found challenging in interpreting how should Christians handle these challenges in in teaching the gospel Matthew yeah um, I mean there's so many texts that are hard in Matthew and any gospel they're long um, but uh, a few came to mind, come to mind immediately, uh, two specifically. Number one, and, and we'll probably, it kind of revolves around the theme that we've been talking about, but um, probably the most, one of the most famous verses, but also one of the most difficult verses, sections is in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, when Jesus says, do not think I've come to abolish law and the prophets, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he says, not in an iota, not of the law will be passed away until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes these will be at least in the kingdom of and so forth and so on. So what he's doing there is he's he's actually affirming the law uh, in, in, a, in an amazing way, but he's not just affirming the law, he's just he's saying he fulfills the law. And I think as Christians, this is confusing because you come into Paul's letter and he's like, you don't have to follow the law, it's fine, Gentiles, don't you don't need to get circumcised. Actually, if you do get circumcised, you're abandoning Jesus because Jesus is all you need. And you come to attack this in the Gospels and you're like, how can Matthew say this? How can he say not a piece of the law will fall? And I think... This is a difficult text because we're trying to put our whole Bible together and say, wait, if we're in the New Covenant, how can Jesus say that, that not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until it's accomplished? Well, I think what Matthew's doing is he's taking two different poles of thinking. And look, the law is not going to continue in the same way that it always has, but it's also not going in no way. And I think that Christians have a tendency to say one of the two, either it continues in the exact same way, especially in Jesus' day. I think Jews would want to say, yeah, nothing changes, right? And Jesus says, no, it doesn't. It doesn't stay the same, but also it doesn't go away. What happens is right in the middle, I fulfill it, okay? So it doesn't go away, but it doesn't continue in the same way. What happens is I fulfill it. In other words, the word, plerao, is the mo- one of the most important words in Matthew's gospel. He fulfills in terms of he brings it to its completion. This word is used of filling up a cup, of coming to the end of it. It's, and that doesn't mean necessarily uh, it's over. It, it actually means that it continues, but continues in a different way. So he fills up the meaning of the law, but it continues. So when he says in Matthew 5, not a piece of it will go away. Well, not a piece of it will go away because we are still, as new covenant people, Torah followers, but we're Torah followers in the covenant sense. And so there are pieces of the Torah that were relegated to that old at time, but the new covenant promise is actually that the Torah will be written upon our hearts. And so I think Matthew actually bounces out, us out in terms of reading through the rest of the New Testament. And, and our tendency would say, well, none of the law matters anymore. No, 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 that's what, that's not what Jesus 
Testaments. And, and so that text is really tough, and it's so short. And the rest of the New Testament, though, uh, it gives different descriptions of how we relate to the law that, that it's just tough to come to. But I think if, if I've been arguing the Gospels are the climax of the Scriptures, then we need to actually start there and not with Paul and say, how do, how do we make sense of Paul in light of Jesus rather than how do we like make sense of Jesus in light of Paul? <laughs> Does that make sense? So that's just some of the shift I'm trying to bring. Like, let's start with that text and then say, Paul, how can you don't have to be circumcised? How can you say this stuff? But he will also say, love fulfills the law. Love is the completion of the law. And you're like, wait, that's a Jesus-type language. And so Paul believes that the law is going to be fulfilled not only in Jesus, but actually in our own lives. We fulfill the law, following the commands of the Torah through the voice of Jesus. So that's a tough text, but it even more tough because as you get to 521 through 48, you have the, you have heard it was said, but I say to you, heard it was said, but I say to you. And what I hear a lot popularly is you come to that text and you say, hey, uh, the, the law said this, but Jesus says this. He raises the bar on the law. It's actually tough for the event because now you have the spirit. And so the law says, um, the law says don't commit adultery, but the new covenant law through Jesus says don't lust, which is raising the bar. I have the fundamental actually misinterpretation of those verses because we have to read those verses through Matthew 5, 17 through 20, where it says the law, fulfill the law doesn't mean that this is the bar on the law. Fulfill the law means he brings out the true intention of the law. So what Jesus is saying is, you have heard that it was said by your false teachers that you should not commit adultery, but everyone's like, oh, it's fine if we lust a little bit. No, Jesus comes along and he says, the whole true intention of my command to not commit adultery was to change your heart. The mm. problem was your heart was not changed because you are hard-hearted. Now I'm going to give you my spirit. Now you're actually going to be able to complete, to fulfill the Torah because it was always meant to get to your heart. So the intention of the law, Jesus is clarifying it. He's actually not raising the bar. This is what the law was always meant to do. So I don't like that language of raising the bar, turning up the heat on them. Rather, he's saying, he's showing us as the true teacher of the law. This is what the law meant to do all along. It just couldn't do it in your own hearts because you were hard hearted. So um, that's one, like, he, like everyone has different views of those texts, but that's one method of text that I think is really important in terms of understanding the rest of Matthew. Um, I, I I have other text, but it's really short. Another text. Can I go to it? Will you give me permission to go to it? Go the for other it. text I thought of, oops, this one's short, but it's fun, is Matthew 27, 52. When, when Jesus is crucified, and it says the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints had fallen asleep, paper raised, and they came out, went to the Holy Spirit City, and appeared to many. And you're like, what is happening? No other gospel is this. Like, what what is going on here? And I don't have all the answers for what's happening here, but if you take that idea of you think, what Old Testament story is this echoing and you think back to the valley of dry bones in ezekiel when the bones raise to life and i think that that's probably the text that's behind here and that what's happened i don't know why the rest of the gospel workers don't recount this but what's happened is that when jesus dies there's this pro or this pre-resurrection thing that happens where the bodies of the saints up and go visit people in other words i think matthew's point is the earth can't hold these people who are raised from the dead because they know the climactic act has happened so even before jesus raised the, it's like the devil has no hold on these people's bodies because even before the resurrection, he knows, uh-oh, it's all over. There, there's this sense in which it's almost like this pre, this pre-picture of the resurrection that's going on here. Now, that, that might raise more questions for people than giving answers, but I, I think uh, we can approach that text and say, okay, what Old Testament text? It's, it's, a, it's a resurrection text. Um, why does it come before? I, I do think it's the power of the resurrection is already be that even before Jesus' resurrection. So uh, I've never preached on that text, but if I did, that... <laughs> yeah, we, we've got to understand, uh, I think a lot of Christians think, if, then, this. So so if this means this, then then it has to mean this. Instead, it's more like, I think oftentimes, I'm not saying always here, but but more of like, there's more of like a tension. It's probably somewhere yeah. more in the middle. It's more of like, right. a, to, to use a, to use kind of the already not yet, it's a both and, not an either or. Um, and, it's, and it's usually not a, an if and, um, as, as we yeah. tend to think in a uh, in the West. Right. That, that's kind of right. what I hear you saying. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. If you're repeating what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh, oh yeah. I'm just, I'm just repeating what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> That means I agree with myself. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So your argument would actually be against yourself. So anyway, so now, now we're just now we're just having a little fun here. 
That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What is what is a central theme of Matthew's gospel? Yeah, I've ar- I've already hinted at, it and I can just keep it brief here. Uh, I think the central theme, and you could describe the central theme in a lot of different ways. So uh, I'm not saying this is the only central theme, but the one I give is fulfillment. Um, that Matthew comes and he's trying to show how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament scriptures and Israel's story. What does that mean? It means that Matthew learned from his teacher that all things are brought to fruition in and through Jesus Christ. All of history, all of Jewish history. He completes it. He brings it to telos, its end, its goal. Um, that doesn't mean it's cast aside, like I said, with the we just looked at Matthew 5. And it doesn't mean it continues in the same way. Rather, he he fills it to its completion. So I think that word plerao, it's just used throughout Matthew. He's gone. Although it's not used right at the beginning of the genealogy, I think it's pretty clear he's actually getting at that idea that every story in Matthew can be looked at through that fulfillment lens. And so that's the one I use. Um, there's other ones we could, in terms of new people of God, um, kingship of, of Jesus, so forth and so on. But I, I like to, it's for this type of project, if we're looking at how does Matthew interpret, it's through that lens of fulfillment. Hmm, that's cool. I like it. And uh, one, one thing I should add is, um, you know, did a teaching on Matthew and uh, they were like, that's great fulfillment, but why does that matter for our people? Like, um, sounds like a good nerdy Bible word, but like, if you're going to do a series, is fulfillment really uh, like speaking to your people? And, and what I try to point them to is what's happening in the fulfillment is that Jesus is being faithful to the promises that God has made to his people. So if you want to bring it to your people in terms of the theme of Matthew, Matthew is showing you that God has made promises to his people and he will keep them no matter what. So I'd say, look at your people then and say, God has made promises to you. He has made promises that if you are in his hand, no one will be able to snatch it from his hand. He has made promises to you that you will inherit a great kingdom that will never and never perish and never go away. He has made promises to you that everything in your life will work out for your good. He's made promises to you that even your suffering is making you more Christ-like. And if he has filled his promises to his people in the Old Testament through Jesus, he will also fulfill his promises to you. So it brings That will uh, definitely preach, as they say, for sure. Uh, why is it so vital that Matthew is not only a disciple of Jesus, the teacher of wisdom, but also a, a discipled scribe? Yeah, so I'm using, really the frame of my book comes from Matthew 13, 52. Matthew 13, 52, and I'll just to you. Uh, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he said, Therefore, every scribe been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. So this text, um, he's saying, if you're trained for the kingdom of heaven, and that word trained is actually the word for discipling. Um, so if, you, if you're an apprentice to Jesus, you are a scribe, or Matthew is the scribe, who is trained or discipled by his chief, and what you're going to do is bring out treasures new and old. I think that is a hint in terms of what Matthew's doing in this whole gospel. What he's doing is he's followed his teacher of wisdom. And Matthew is presented more than any other gospel, I think, as a teacher. And Matthew has been trained by that teacher in terms of how the new and the old relate. And he is now teaching future generations how to be a disciple of Jesus by, through his writing, through teaching generations. So you think of um, Matthew, uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. You think, what are you supposed to do? make disciples by teaching them all things that I commanded you. Now, how does Matthew fulfill that? He fills that by writing the story of Jesus. And so he teaches us about his teacher because he learned from his teacher how to teach. Does that make sense? So the, the, best, the best Bible exegete, the best hermeneutical sin comes from Jesus himself. He wasn't trained. He was trained by the true rabbi, by the true sage teacher. And then now he passes that on to us. And our job is to then pass that on to future. So I think Matthew becomes that scribe who has been discipled for the kingdom of heaven, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. That's really, uh, really insightful. Very insightful, really. Mind-blowing insightful. Um, what, what does Jesus' interaction with Satan in the wilderness in Matthew 4 have to teach Christians today about how to handle temptation and spiritual warfare? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it has a lot to teach us about um, your own personal struggles. Um, but when I come to that text, at least conversation. I, I Earlier I said, what we always have to ask is, what, how, 
how does this echo on the old Testament story lead? So I think actually the first thing we need to do to come, when we come to the kind of temptation story is say, what text is this echoing? I think it's pretty clearly echoing the text of when uh, the Israelites go into the wilderness and are tempted as well. And what you find there is that they fail. They fail because they don't trust God's word. And what you have in Jesus is Jesus comes as the Israel, the new Adam in the wilderness, and he actually conquers the devil in the wilderness where Israel failed. And so I think before we get to memorize scripture, use them. Look to Jesus as your um, the one who has truly accomplished what you could not accomplish. Because you will only have strength to fight temptation if you know that one has fought for you and is fighting for you now. So I think we need to begin there. And that's where you bring that biblical, theological, redemptive, historical view to all these texts. And then you say, and yes, go to the scriptures and find a life in them. Because Jesus is teaching us that even in the Old Testament, God has made promises to us, and we can rely upon his word rather than rely upon the words of Satan. So not only does this story echo the, the, the story of the um, Israelites in the wilderness, but it echoes Adam in the garden. Whose word are you going to trust? Are you going to trust the word devil of the serpent? Or are you going to trust the words of Jesus himself found in the scripture? Oh, I think if you go back to those stories, they start to actually bring so much more life, and then you get to the side. And I, for me, I actually want to get to the practical side more now that I understand Jesus has done it for me, he's working in and through me, and now I need to go to the scriptures and understand what they're saying and use that in my fight and temptation. So start big picture and then go to the practical. I think that's so helpful because, as you just articulated better than I can, um, you know, we do often run to the practical. We, we often will run from Matthew 4 to Ephesians 6 and say, okay, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. And there's nothing necessarily wrong, but as you said, we have to go and understand the, the whole what the whole Bible says. And when we do that, we clearly see what, what you just said is, is true. So. Right. And I don't, the first point of Matthew's text is how do you fight temptation? It's how is Jesus accomplished and fought temptation for you? That's the first first level meaning of that text. Yeah, I agree. We know that uh, Matthew's gospel ends with the Great Commission, and you've talked about that uh, here Mm -hmm. already. Are there particular things about the Great Commission you think we often overemphasize or even misunderstand in the church today? And if so, what are those, and how do we correct those misunderstandings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. The the things I talk about in class about that text is that you have in 2819 that that idea, which is actually a participle, the main command is to make disciples. And so the even project that I did in, in the book of Matthew is that Matthew is a disciple of Jesus who is teaching us how to make disciples. And so the main command there is make disciples, but it's based it's based on 2818 when Jesus says, All authority and in heaven and on earth has been to me. Go therefore, therefore, because I have all authority. So why can we go out and make disciples? It's because Jesus is the true Son of Man and David. He's the true Messiah and the true King. That language comes from Daniel 7. So he is the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father, and therefore he has given us authority. We are his ambassadors. So we can't, I think we a lot of times we talk about text about what we're supposed to do, but it's all based, so maybe this is answer your question, it's all based on what it has done for us and what he has accomplished first. We have no authority, we have no power, we have no command without Jesus first ascending to the right hand of the Father and saying, your, yours is the kingdom. Like, he gives Jesus the kingdom, and he's sit at my right hand, and now we are Jesus' ambassadors to go into all nations. So I, I think we get that authority of Jesus, peace first, and then we go out and we make disciples of all nations. Now, what's interesting here is that, and remember, I'm always talking about how does this story, Act Testament story, this command echoes the edict from Cyrus at the end of Second Chronicles, and he's telling Israelites to go rebuild the temple. So I think if we lay that over this text, what does he do us in, in the New Covenant era? He's telling us, as we go out and make disciples, we are building the temple. This is comprised of the New Temple now. It's all nations. It's Jews and Gentiles. So we build the Newt, we build up Jesus's body, because the temple is Jesus's body. We build up Jesus by teaching, by baptizing, and and by going, right? Make disciples, baptizing, teaching, going, doing all these things, and and we bring them into the body of Christ. We actually grow the body of Christ. So uh, one scholar has said that all of Matthew's themes run through the Great Commission. I think that's largely true. You could really do a whole study just on the Great Commission and say, 
uh, Jesus is actually, or Matthew is actually repeating everything that he said in the rest of the gospel. And the promise, the command is make disciples based on the authority of Jesus. And the promise is I'm always going to be with you. A temple presence will always be with you through the spirit. And so um, we are the temple. We are, are actually growing the temple and we're inviting the Gentiles to come in. And so it's all based on the authority of Jesus and the presence of Jesus with us. And uh, some of the other gospels has have Jesus leaving at the end of Matthew's gospel. He's still there. I think the point is actually purposeful. Jesus is with us always to the end of age. Oh, doesn't even recount the ascension, right? It's just done because I think he wants to with, you have Jesus' presence with you. The authority of the king is with you. Therefore, you can go out and make disciples. It's just an amazing text that we could talk about forever. There's so much in there. Man, you just gave us like so much to think about, even about that passage that I don't think a lot of people have really thought about. So, great answer. I know I haven't thought of it that way, so so that's, that's really good. Uh, there's a lot that, you know, we haven't covered, and as you rightly said uh, multiple times, um, you know, you could go on and on about this. Um, <laughs> as we wrap up this conversation though can you give us a few takeaways yeah i mean i think um some of the things i've already said look uh, what, what i'm trying to do in this book is, is try to point to jesus as the fulfillment of the hopes of israel and so as you read the gospel look for jesus as the new whatever figure you can fill in the blank honestly it's all over the place um look for him as the new isaiah prophet look for him as the new Jeremiah. you see at the end of the gospel he's the one who laments after israel he laments for he says why won't you repent that's that's the new jeremiah text um you see him in two zachariah you see him as the new everything and so as you go through matthew and the rest of the gospel i'll have your ear down to the ground listening thinking how is jesus completing this story how is he fulfilling this story and and i think I think you'll be surprised to see how much these gospels come to life as you see those things. Um, this is just one. It's, there's many different ways to read the gospels. This is one of the ways. Um, you could have a more historical view. This is a more liter, uh, literary, biblical, logical view of the gospels. But I think this brings just great life and great energy to, and it makes me want to read and study them more. Um, I think sometimes when we come to the gospels, we're like, yeah, we know that story. It's great. Yeah, he had the temptation. Yeah, he healed. Yeah, he taught. That, that's that's wonderful. No, 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 no. Start pressing in more. That would be my plea. Press in more and start looking into those details. And I hope this book is just uh, part of that process for people. Mm, well said. Uh, where can people find mo- out more about your your work on social media or uh, about your writing? Yeah, I mean, I think just I'm probably most active on Twitter uh, um, in terms of social media. And so I try to post in terms of what I'm working on. And yeah, I just look at, look at my Amazon author page, I guess. And there's a few books there that I have. And then they're going to keep coming out as I finish these other ones. And so um, Twitter is a great way to just get a hold of me or through email or anything like that. Um, but I, you know, I try to encourage people on Twitter or whatever social media we are just in terms of posting about what I'm learning from the scriptures. And so really I use it as an outlet for me to just think out loud and post some things that I'm learning as I'm working through things. And so currently I'm working through Acts. So I'm posting a lot on Acts and just thinking about Acts out loud with people. And it's great to have a community conversation. And so I'd love to hear from people in terms of, I don't agree with that or I have a different one. They're always sharpening and they're really helpful. And so I just love having conversations in terms of the scriptures um, on those social media platforms. They, they, a lot of people critique those platforms and say they're, they're very toxic, but I think it's just how you use them. How do you use them? Do you use them to build up others? Do you use them to pass on information? And um, uh, yeah, it can get toxic, but I think we can use it and uh, redeem our time upon that. Well said, Patrick. Well, what I appreciate about you so much is uh, you're very thoughtful, um, and your your thinking is very saturated in the scriptures. And we need more more people like that. And so, thank you for helping us um, to to learn how to do that well and and modeling that. You you do that exceptionally well on social media and in your writing. So, thank you, buddy. Thanks, Dave. It's great uh, being here and talking to you again, and uh, blessings to you and your listeners. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you were encouraged by today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. For more uplifting and thought-provoking content, please visit us online at servantsofgrace.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Servants of Grace and on Facebook at facebook.com slash servants of grace. We hope you have a blessed day and we will see you next time.